Hello, my name is Frederick Stutz. I'm a professor at San Diego State University, Department of Geography, and the Joint Doctoral Program at the University of California. I've been a professor here for 30 years, 29 years teaching, and one year looking for a parking place. Today I'd like to invite you to come to my class downstairs in just a moment where I'm teaching world cultural geography. What I do is divide the world into 10 regions, North America, Latin America, Black Africa, the Middle East, which is the Islamic world, Europe, Russia and its neighbors, South Asia, which is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and associated countries such as Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and then Southeast Asia. And for each one, I'll do a physical sketch and a climatic sketch, and then I'll go into the cultures of the region and show how all of these countries within each region have a similar culture, have similar languages and language families, have similar religions and therefore lifestyles, and ways of making a living, family practices, and economic development. And so if you can understand 10 cultural regions, 10 world regions, then you can understand the context of each one. Each one has a, a particular uh, problem. Each one has a particular developmental level. And that's what we try to cover in this class. This is a general education class at San Diego State and is also a general education class at most universities across the country. I've written my own textbook. Uh, it's called uh, The World Economy. It's used at 200 colleges and universities across the country, Canada and the United Kingdom. We're on our fourth edition. This uh, book talks about the ways of making a living, the ways that populations develop the land, use their resources, use technology, uh, produce uh, three kinds of, of uh, economic activity, agriculture, manufacturing, services, and now telecommunications are the uh, post-industrial economy. And uh, we look at each of these world regions with the context in the context of each of these four types of economic development. Then we look at world trade and what the future is um, for uh, trade and world economic development, especially for backward areas such as, such as Africa. This is a different course, however, so let me just put that down. Um, another course that I teach in the mission field is called Divine Drama. Divine Drama is a diagrammatic set of uh, materials. I have 200 diagrams which describe the Old Testament, the New Testament, um, biblical narrative, as well as the doctrinal developments. I've taught uh, this course, which is a two or three unit college course at um, seminaries in South America, most recently in 2000 at Central Bible College in Bogota, Colombia. In 2001, Karen Sebish Bible Institute in uh, Karen Sebish, Romania with the Romanian Outreach Ministries, of which I'm a member of the board of directors. And then finally in 2002 at the Evangelical uh, Seminary in a Timisoara, Assemblies of God, where we did uh, divine drama and a historical development with a good sprinkling of geography uh, for the um, doctrinal uh, development of the Christian church. Now, most recently, I'm teaching uh, the Purpose Driven Life at uh, my church and I'm interested in uh, teaching this um, at Bible colleges across uh, Eastern Europe and Latin America. As you know, this is a best-selling uh, textbook, which um, is um, number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And it's uh, having a tremendous impact across the country with regard to revival. I say it's the biggest book since uh, Luther's Small Catechism, which started the uh, Protestant Revolution in 1521. And now there's a billion Protestants and a billion uh, Catholics. It's divided into five categories. The first is on worship. It's our lifestyle. It's our lifestyle that's pleasing to God. The second is on fellowship. It's our relationship to other Christians. Uh, the third is discipleship, becoming more like Christ. Everything designed in our life is uh, designed by the Lord to bring us to a relationship with Him and to bring us into a union with His, his Son, Jesus Christ, and to make us more Christ-like. Finally, there's service to our church, to the community of believers and to those outside, to Jer Jer Jerusalem, to Samaria, to Galilee, uh, and to the other end, other ends of the earth. And then there's finally evangelism. And we'll spend uh, 40 days talking about uh, these principles, which is having an earth-shaking, uh, revolutionary uh, change in the Christian church in America today. Thank you. Uh, where I used to work for the State Department in the 1990s, and I had been at San Diego State for 20 years, uh, 19 years teaching, and one year looking for a parking place. <laughs> When I came back to San Diego State, uh, I thought they'd give me my job back. <laughs>
But uh, they said, no, make a video and send it to us, and uh, we'll evaluate it, and we'll see if you're good enough. And they said, well, it looks good, and you've improved, but we don't think you're quite ready. And I said, look, I want to come back to San Diego State and teach so much that I'll even come and teach for free. And they said, now you're ready. <laughs> As you know, the Cold War lasted from approximately 1917 during the Bolshevik Revolution until 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Now, I had two opportunities to understand what went on during the Soviet Union period from uh, the experts. And one expert was uh, Gorbachev himself. Gorbachev uh, was the final premier up until 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed, Boris Yeltsin took over, and now you know it's President Putin. You're going to hear uh, the deputy chief of the Soviet Union's 100,000 combat troop in Afghanistan, Borisov. He was a feared military strongman and a communist leader, considered the architect of Armageddon. Here's his picture right here and his hat that he gave me. He had a uh, price on his head from the CIA who smuggled handheld stinger missiles in through the Khyber Pass to support the local Mujahideen. We had a lady speak here from Afghanistan, and she was alive and living in Afghanistan at that time. And sure enough, the uh, Stinger missiles shot down his helicopter like a Black Hawk. It went down, and eight men exploded on the ground, and the helicopter exploded, but Borisov did not die. So Borisov has his own story, and uh, he will tell you that story in just a second. He told me that story, and in my slides that I show you of Russia, you'll see that uh, he has a great story. We're kind of pen pals now. He comes to the United States. Uh, twice a year to raise money for his cause, which is to build churches, of all things, on military bases, because now there's a new openness, a new glasnost, if you will, that started in 1991, and he's allowed to do that and still be in the military. The other interview I had was with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev spoke at uh, Princeton University in 1992. Uh, he had been out of a job for one year, and so he was going around on a speaking tour, making a little bit of money, and he gave me 14 points 14 points that were collaborated by Borisov that I'm going to give to you right now. The moment ago, we had Alicia spoke from Moscow. She grew up there. She's only been in America two years. And she said, no, my parents, they prefer to have the communist system because they had social medicine. They had housing subsidies. They were guaranteed a job. They were guaranteed cradle to grave social programs that they're not guaranteed now. And some people are dying as a, as a uh, result of it. After Chernobyl, the power of a nuclear weapon, after Star Wars, or SDI, the fact that we could defend against nuclear weapons, the fact that the Soviet Union could not defend against the nuclear weapons because they didn't have the technology or the money to develop Star Wars, Gorbachev told me he knew it was over in his own heart. Also, solidarity. Solidarity was told to me by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and by uh, General Borisov. How do I look? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The cycles of birth in the United States are shown in this graph. It's divided into the John Wayne generation peaking in 1920, the baby boom generation, by far the largest, peaking in 1964, and the echo generation. The largest generation by far in history is the baby boom, and it's giving power to the spending wave in the United States. Chart 2 shows the rate of baby boomers entering the labor force, and it is a tool that predicts inflation, according to economist Harry Dent. Inflation will stay low throughout the coming boom. This figure shows that consumer price index mirrors the labor force growth. Figure 3 shows that the peak spending years, according to the United States Department of Labor Statistics, when people are between ages 45 and 50, they spend the most in these years. This histogram shows how people spend money through their various five-year periods in their life cycle. Harry Dent is a demographic research scholar and brilliant stock market strategist. The 10 years of research that have gone into my textbook have reviewed some of his material and the material collaborates his uh, projections for the stock market in a remarkably a significant uh, way. When the U.S. births are lagged forward 49 years and are compared with the best measurement of the performance of the U.S. economy, the Standard & Poor's 500 Index,